Bartholomew Kuma has made a deal with the devil, but very counterproductively to said devil's desires, this has actually put Kuma on the path to God. One Piece is unpredictable by nature, but even then, I don't think any of us expected him to show up on Luffy's doorstep. It's quite ominous, and who knows what the world government is going to order him to do from here. But what I do know is that the opening scene of this chapter is really strong. I love Vegapunk's discussion with Kizaru, because it's a bit of an elephant in the room moment. It takes us a whole page to acknowledge that Kuma is in the room with them, and he's this is a massive presence, which I think is a really fun way to structure a scene. And Kuma looks like he's been called into the principal office. This is the look of a resigned man who knows that some sort of punishment is coming. I'm also a huge fan of Kizaru's, what I believe all the kids are calling Drip. It takes a very special individual to be able to clash pinstripes against checkers, but Kizaru more than pulls it off and comes complete with a fedora so that he can milady anyone he comes across. I actually wonder what happened to the fedora because we saw him wear it in Fisher Tiger's flashback as well. So it was a trademark Kizaru feature for like a decade. Why, why did he get rid of it? And just as Kuma called it himself in the last chapter, we see a very tense scene of him making a deal with what I guess is quite a literal devil. And I'm loving that Saturn has the authority to negotiate this all on his own without consulting his fellow geriatrics. He is the warrior god of science and defense. So I suppose he has complete discretion over the warlord system because they would fall under defense. But this, mate, this is yet another chapter that broke me. Not by surprise either, I saw this happening in real time. When Saturn demands that Kuma gives up his humanity and thus his life, there's this panel of Kuma looking like he's in despair with his hand over his face, but I knew that he was going to look up and it would probably be the happiest we've ever seen him. I've been reading One Piece far too long for that sort of trickery to work on me, but it still hit pretty damn hard. And it's another one of those actions which reminds me of Luffy, because our captain did a very similar thing on Amazon Lily. Boa Hancock offered Luffy either a ship to get off the island, which he really needed because there was no other way off, or she offered to restore Marguerite and the others. And even though this very well could have been the end of Luffy's pirating career, he gleefully accepted the offer to turn Marguerite and the others back. Again, I want to reinforce the severity of that situation. Had things not gone in a very unpredictable, love sicknessy sort of way, Luffy was asked to choose between his dream and these three random people that he'd just met. And Luffy was genuinely happy to make that sacrifice because it meant that they got to live. And with Kuma, we're following a very similar trade offer. We cure Bonnie, but we kill you and turn you into our weapon. And just like Luffy, Kuma accepted it without a second thought. And I might come to regret these words later, but when it comes to everything regarding Bonnie, I think that Saint Satin is being quite reasonable. Or at least at the moment, he doesn't show any intention on going back on his word. Although whenever a deal like this is made in, well, in any media, there is a tendency for the antagonist to go all Darth Vader and alter the deal, which is what you'd expect from a character like Orochi or Spandam, but I'm not sure where I stand with Satin. I'd like to think that as evil as he is, he's at least a league above the petty evils of the Orochis and the Spandams. But at the same time, he could also be far below them because again, he's, he's a literal devil, bad, bad man. Vegapunk, of course, raises an objection. And we've already had that flashback of him drawing the connection between memories and the human soul. But as we see, Vegapunk's morality only holds him back so far, which is not very far, because he gets to work pretty immediately and becomes madly invested in creating the weapon of his dreams. It even inspires him to go on and create his satellites. And so Kuma's sacrifice is probably the most scientifically inspirational thing that's ever happened to Vegapunk. And as we see for the next six months, I think that everyone's in a bit of denial about what's actually happening here. My favorite, but also my most conflicting scene in the chapter is the pizza party where everyone's doing the Joy Boy dance because it's a moment of pure bliss. You've got all of these agendas coming together for one perfect moment in time where everyone can let go and be happy. Think about it this way. You've got a Marine Admiral partying with a Revolutionary Army associate and a future member of the worst generation. We've never seen this kind of unity before and I'm not sure we will before the end of the series. And of course, specifically Kizaru dancing is amazing. This is easily the most expressive he's ever been. Even when Luffy fisted him in the head, he was more or less neutral about that whole ordeal. But it turns out, give him some pizza and Kizaru's a new man. It's also not lost on me that as the user of the light fruit, that here we have someone very close to being a literal sun god. And again, he looks genuinely happy for the 
first and I think only time in his life. Meanwhile, the saddest thing of all is that Kuma is also genuinely happy because he gets six months of time with his daughter where there are no worries. And from his perspective, that's infinitely more than he could have ever asked for in this situation. And also, you know, the reason why pizza is Bonnie's favorite food is probably because of this memory. Because this was, and actually I think still is, the pinnacle of happiness in her life as well. Surrounded by food, surrounded by family, surrounded by Nakama. And then you remember that one day soon, Bonnie is going to believe that everyone in this room betrayed her father. And then Oda deliberately inserts stuff like this to further break me. Bonnie making this little drawing of Kuma is the most precious, innocent, and beautiful thing I think we've seen in this flashback so far. And narratively, it's all in service of crushing us when the ultimate moment of tragedy does come. Thank you for that, Oda. But Kuma ends up using Bonnie's drawing as his Jolly Roger after becoming a warlord of the sea, because this is how he wants to be seen in the world, as the father that Bonnie adores, so there's no better representation, which is such a painfully sweet way of answering a question we've had ever since his introduction. Bartholomew Kuma is a pirate, and yet we've never seen his Jolly Roger. Very odd, but I'm glad that Oda didn't show it, because if he'd created it earlier, it definitely wouldn't have been this, and it's amazing that he had the opportunity to do something this beautiful. During the montage, there's also a ship we see pulling up to Egghead Island, and it says Umit Cargo Ship, which is a reference to one of the emperors of the underworld, the aforementioned Umit. He's the shipping magnate who was invited to Big Mom's tea party. And I know that this is probably incredibly boring, but I find it fascinating to see a ship in one piece that isn't a pirate, marine, or revolutionary vessel. Almost every ship we see in this series is a ship of war. We almost never see merchant vessels, which would be a massive sector in a world like this. And I guess as a man in my 30s, I'm starting to develop a real appreciation for logistics. Like when that Suez Canal thing happened, mate, I was hooked. But eventually our young Bonnie is cured and returns to the Sorbet Kingdom as agreed upon. And she's put into the care of a very suspicious looking nurse named Alpha, who is an agent of CP8 and looks exactly like Califa from CP9 and now CP0. I know that Alpha doesn't sound like Califa in English, but it sounds much closer in Japanese because it would be Arufa. So there's definitely an intentional relation happening here. I say relation because the one thing we do know is that this cannot be Califa. Because by this time, she'd already been planted as Iceberg Secretary on Water 7, which happened five years before the beginning of One Piece. My guess is that Alpha is Califa's sister and or mother who is immune from aging. Because what happens in Cypherpol culture is that new agents are often the children of old agents. For example, Califa's father is Lasky, who we see in Robin's flashback. So if he had more than one child, then of course they're both gonna become Cypherpol agents. And it's always pretty awkward when one sibling is significantly more successful than the other. Because Califa got accepted into the illustrious but very secretive CP9, whereas Alpha only made it as far as the very shamefully public CP8. To be fair, regardless of ranks, both Alpha and Califa ended up becoming popular tags on Red Chu being nurse and secretary. We also get introduced to Queen Dowager Connie again, or I suppose for the first time. Very curiously, she's given an Oda box in this chapter, despite having actually been introduced in the previous chapter. My thought is this. Oda realized that not enough people remembered that time when Bonnie impersonated Connie. Not enough people made that connection. And so he felt he needed to properly introduce her in this chapter. But this takes us to Kuma's goodbye. And One Piece at this point is almost like emotional torture porn because we're given the contrasting views of Bonnie and Kuma with Kuma telling the truth of the matter to the audience. And his last words to Bonnie are perfect. I'm so glad you were born. I really don't think he could have chosen these words any better because now, even if Bonnie does go on to learn the truth of her birth, Earth, then there's a path to recovery because Kuma made it known just how happy her existence made him. Then he leaves and from this point on, I don't know if he'll ever see his daughter again. I mean, I expect Kuma to show up on Egghead, but I don't know how much of him I expect to see. And then our tyrant officially becomes a warlord, accompanied by another very exciting montage of all of the then current warlords reacting to the news. And I love chapters like these where we get a snapshot of what was happening all over the world at a very specific time. They're so rare and it really reminds me of chapter zero. But I love that even though this is Kuma's flashback, we still see like three whole straw hats in this chapter. Firstly, seeing Crocodile and Robin, or I guess I should say Miss All Sunday together, should give you a pretty great idea of how close we are to the start of pre-time skip One Piece. Baroque Works is in full swing. They've got their base and they're even referencing the rainmaking ship that we only saw after Crocodile was defeated. That's what he was using to control the rainfall in Alabaster with the dance powder and then the stuff. But tell me, I can't be the only one to be so glad to see Robin back in a 
had again. That was the aspect of her design that I loved the most. And to this day, I'm still so sad that Oda got rid of it because she's an Indiana Jones style archeologist. She needs a hat. We also catch a glimpse of Doflamingo that more so than anything reminds me that I really miss Doflamingo's presence in the story. And I hope that he gets out of prison soon to cause some more shenaniganry. But by far the most interesting part of this montage is the section with Ace and the Whitebeard Pirates because we've now confirmed that Kuma was not one of the original seven warlords. There's another unnamed warlord who was defeated by Ace. And despite the fact that we see him already part of Whitebeard's crew in this chapter, this almost certainly happened before Ace joined because in novel Ace, he was offered the position before he went into the new world. And there is that gap between Kuma making the deal with Saturn and being publicly announced as a warlord, which actually the whole thing is a bit confusing because surely they wouldn't have left that warlord position vacant for six whole months. They would definitely need to fill it ASAP like they did with Crocodile for the sake of global stability and such. So I'm actually not quite sure how the timelines end up, but I'm pretty sure Ace beat the Warlord before he joined Whitebeard. Otherwise that would mean that a Warlord got into a conflict with an Emperor of the Sea, and that seems very unlikely. Although if that did happen, there is one candidate who it could be, which is this unnamed giraffe pirate who Ace beat in the new world in episode A, who fun fact was the previous user of Kaku's devil fruit, as demonstrated by the giraffeness. And you know, it could make some sense if he was a warlord because all of them have pretty blatant animal themes, at least the original set did. So a giraffe would have fit right in. So after recording this video and going back on the chapter, Ace does actually confirm that the warlord position was left vacant for quite some time, as he says that they finally found a replacement. So it looks like my fleeting dreams of a giraffe warlord have officially been crushed. Whatever the case, it just goes to show that this system has been a mess since day one. The seven warlords were supposed to be a force of stability, but even before Luffy started knocking them down like clowns in a carnival game, the world was always in a very precarious balance to say the least. I'd bet that this isn't even the only unnamed warlord either. There's probably been quite a few over the years who have been forcibly retired. And something that I didn't even register until my second read through of this chapter is that this this is probably the only time that we will ever see adult Ace and adult Sabo both alive on the same page. Sabo obviously still has his amnesia and they're both in very different places in the world, but something felt weird about this page when I first saw it and I don't think it sank in until much later, but it adds another layer of tragedy to this already incredibly, probably peak tragic backstory. It's sort of like the pizza party. This is a moment in time where Ace, Sabo and actually Luffy were all alive and happy doing their own thing. Of course, we also see Gecko Moria looking just as as unthreatening as usual, taking a nap in his big comfy bed instead of doing anything, you know, piratey or just anything in general. It is nice and nostalgic to see him though. And honestly, that's the real brilliance of this part of the chapter. Through this characters, it takes you on a journey of One Piece because the warlords have been integral aspects to almost every arc. Through this, we go through Alabaster, Dressrosa, Marineford, Amazon Lily, Thriller Bark. It's like a giant rewind. And it's all in service of delivering us right back to the beginning of the series on that very last page. And and on that note, yes, this chapter was packed with characters, but the ones who surprised me the most were Kobe and Alveda. They seem like such a truly random choice considering their company, but I have two guesses as for why Oda included them. One is that these characters are much more fresh in Oda's mind after the release of the live action. Kobe especially took a big step up in prominence, but the second is what I was talking about before. Checking in with them gives us a nice transition back into East Blue where we ultimately end up. Through that section of the chapter, we're getting closer and closer to the actual beginning of one Piece, and more so than even seeing Luffy on Dawn Island, seeing Kobe and Alveda very much activates the nostalgia of that era. Also a slightly depressing fact that I often forget, and this does give us a good sense of the timeline, I suppose, but Kobe ended up in Alveda's service because he got on the wrong boat. Kobe wanted to go fishing, but instead he got on the pirate ship. Quite a common mistake actually, because Zoro did a post time skip, but Kobe didn't have the strength to rectify his mistake. And so he actually spent two whole years with Alveda, which is too many. But again, I don't think any of us could have predicted that Kuma would end up right outside Dawn Island. Not just Dawn Island either, he is specifically right outside Fusha Village. And this may be where we find out how Kuma knew that Luffy was Dragon's son. Because as far as we know, Dragon hasn't shared that information with even his closest revolutionary associates. And Kuma doesn't even count as that anymore because he's been very, very absent from army duties. What I want to know is if Kuma was ordered vaguely in the direction of East Blue to await further instruction, or if he came here by choice and if so, 
know why. What I'm picturing right now isn't Luffy meeting Kuma, because Luffy probably would have remembered such a thing, unless Kuma took his memories, which is a thing he can do. But putting all of that to one side, what I'm thinking is Kuma catching a glimpse of Luffy and perhaps recognizing him as Nika, which then lays the groundwork for why Kuma goes so far to help him on Sabadi and even dedicate his shell to guarding the Thousand Sunny for two years. It could be as simple as hearing a faint drum beat from that general childly direction and doom 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 doom. Or maybe he just witnesses the sheer joy of Luffy and decides to invest in the future, like what Shanks did with his arm. I can also imagine a scenario where Kuma encounters Garp on one of his many Fusha village vacations. And the two would actually have quite a bit to talk about given that they have a whole dragon in common. And then Garp could casually drop something like, ah, oh, see that child thing over there? That's Dragon Sun. Because realistically, I'm not sure who else would know at this stage. Kuma either has to hear it from Garp or Dragon, or maybe Whoopsap if he's been made privy to this information. He does seem to know an awful lot about Luffy and recognizes that he does indeed have some grander destiny. And if you'd like to keep up to date on said destiny, then please do subscribe to the channel for consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your YouTube feed.